All right. Um, welcome. <coughs> this has been a wonderful week, and we've had some very, very wonderful um, discussions and exchanges about the works of the five wonderful writers who are here with us. It is significant that some of the issues that were discussed during the panel discussion, of course, will never find final or consummate answers, but the discussions will carry on, at least in our heads or minds or across emails or tweets or blogs or whatever it is. But tonight's topic is going to be quite different, quite special. Because in Singapore, at least, uh, the black American literature or the Afro-American literature, or whatever name we give it, has not been very prominently featured. I should actually say what I said yesterday at the forum, at the panel, that in Singapore we began to actually read seriously, you know, seriously read American literature only in 1973, even though the university had been going on for about seven, eight decades before that. So it was a very late arrival for American literature at the English department of the then English uh, you know, university called the University of Singapore. We had the Chinese university, Nanyang University, where they didn't teach American literature at all. And in fact, in the early days of Nanyang University, they taught literature from Soviet Russia, right, and China, and translation, those kinds of things. But the, the, the Afro-American experience has been very, very uh, alien to most of us in Singapore. My own personal blessing has been that the late Darwin Turner, for example, and occasionally Skip Gates, you know, we would get together. These are quite well-known names in the in the black Afro-American world. And we'll talk about the problems and challenges facing the Afro-American writers. They all alive, right? More the ones who are alive, but the ones who are also no longer with us. It has a very long and, and illustrious tradition, I'm sure. Maurice, as he goes through today, talking about Horizons, most again, will go through all of these, but you know, the, the illustrious names, Gustava, Vasa, Chesna, Damba, you know, everybody knows about Frederick Douglass, those kinds of things, and then coming back more to more recent times, Baldwin and the rest. I mean, these were very, very exciting writers, but people like myself were totally ignorant of these. So when I finally got around to reading their works, I was amazed that the wealth and the riches were there. Very often these are literatures of pain and struggle and suffering, those kinds of things. But perhaps now the horizons have changed and maybe there's a literature of celebration as well. I don't know, but for all of this and more and other surprises, let me now give you Professor Maurice Wayne. Thank you very much for being here and thank you for, for, for inviting me. Thank you for the invitation and for the support that you have for the community and I was here. Um, I've known Chris Paul now for 2002, 2002. Uh, and when you came to this first church story conference um, uh, in Iowa, and then from there we went to Spain, and he's been there ever since. Um, and uh, obviously, I'll tell you I'm going to have a work for Roger, um, and I'm glad to meet the others that I have not met before. So this has really been a, a nice uh, welcome to coming here. I uh, really do appreciate it. It's also, um, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk about this topic and, and other things as well. Uh, when uh, Paul mentioned uh, the name of Darwin Turner, as a graduate student, I sit to him and setting up the second African American Studies program at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. The first one was uh, in San Francisco State with Nathan Hare. Uh, and it was a very difficult time, an important time. This is one that came out of, in fact, by the terms of the crisis of the Vietnam War and the student unrest and all those kinds of things. I don't know if you could have some of you old enough to know that in Madison they grew up in Africa. Um, and then those students who did that flew to Canada uh, and we stayed there. And a lot of, as you know, anti-Vietnamese students left the United States and went to Canada. 
So it was a tough time. When we started the program, of the course was uh, for 62, Introduction to African American Literature. Uh, and Darwin Turner taught it in a big class of about uh, 300 students. And there were two or three graduate assistants, and I was the only graduate assistant. And our thought was to begin this program to get students uh, engaged in meeting African American Literature. And then to slowly <coughs> mesh it into the regular English department program in Canada that was available. Uh, Walter Reinhardt was the chair of the English department at that time, <coughs> a very noted American scholar. And what you may not know is that American literature as a discipline did not begin in, in the United States in the department until the 1930s. But when you think about it, all those years in terms of Buckthorn, Merrill, Canyon, and so forth, um, trying to get their things published. Howells, as a discipline within departments, it did not start until the mid 30s. Um, and so at the University of Wisconsin, it started around 1950. Uh, Walter Wright came in 1955. And so he had just developed this program, he had just set up this good core, core curriculum. And he was there, and Harry Hayden Clark was there, you know that name. Uh, and he was my advisor, as a matter of fact. He was one of the premier names in American literature at that time. And they had uh, redefined the core. And they had a really strong American literature department. And it was in place now for about 10 years, and guess what, all of a sudden, here come these interlopers, you know, wanting to change it. I mean, it hadn't been established that long. It was just really getting hold. And all of a sudden, you come and wanted to change it even more with African American literature. And on his heels was feminist literature, women's studies. Uh, and on his heels was gay and lesbian literature. And he could see all that stuff in the horizon. So we had a conversation with him. And he said, I'll talk to the board. Because the curriculum had not been finalized. He said, I'll talk to the board. He said, maybe Wisconsin would be the first one to really and fully incorporate it. Because Wisconsin was a really, really very, very liberal university at that time, still is. Uh, it was a liberal state at that time, it's not now. <laughs> um, and so he went and talked to the board, and we had a five-day vote. <coughs> and we lost about five votes in terms of fully being incorporated. I mean, we came that close that closed in 1969 in terms of having a fully integrated American literature canon with appropriate representation of blacks and women and other minorities in it. Uh, so when that happened, the region said, fine, you're not going to incorporate it, we're going to give them their own budget, we're going to set up a program, we're going to give us some director, uh, I forget the woman's name, but I talked to her not long ago, who was the director. She was very, very good. But this was a time in which everything had to be black, black, black. Her husband was Jewish. And when we held the first reception, she came very proud because about 300 students showed up. And in walks her Jewish husband. And things just went from her. And I said, I'm going to turn around, you got to be kidding me. Are you crazy? I mean, you know, we're talking about people who have been oppressed, all right, and left out of the system. And you want to, you know, get rid of this woman because of that? But she stayed for about another year because she left. Uh, and so that was the beginning of the African American Study Program at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, at our opening, people like Nathan Hare, Art Fuller, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, Tony Martin, who at that time was the editor at the uh, um, I forget the name. She had really had not been that recognized yet. Sonia Sanchez uh, came. At that time, Harvard was not there. There was no skip gates in terms of, you know, uh, there was Hart Fuller from, from Pennsylvania. Uh, Houston Baker was also from Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, we uh, took pictures and we had all kinds of uh, publicity, and that began the program. 
and did the still not raise it. Uh, Nelly McKay took it over in later years and was a really, really very good uh, proponent of it. So that was the start of African American literature. And let me go back a few years and tell you how I got into the literature and why I thought it was important. Um, I'm going to do something I promise I would not do. Uh, but uh, Robin asked me to talk about certain things in terms of growing up and in terms of the importance of the African American concept of who I was. And so I'm going to talk about myself in terms of my approach to literature and why it was important to me. I'm the youngest of four siblings, uh, born in Oklahoma. Be nice. Um, I was the only one who was born in the house that we lived in at that time. Everyone else had been born in the house, but I was born in the house. Uh, and I asked my mother, they don't why was I born in the house? She said, you seem very comfortable there. <laughs> I said, I wasn't born here. She said, I know. But you seem very comfortable there. So I decided, you know, midwife and you in the house. Very uh, bizarre. My father was one of ten. And uh, nine of them lived within a mile and a half of my grandfather's house. All right. I mean, so there was one across the street, there was one, he had a big coffee, and there was one uh, there. Uh, one of those brothers had 13 children. One had seven, uh, one had five. Uh, so there were about 25 of that playing right there. My mother was one of what I thought was four children. She was actually one of eight. I didn't find out about eight until about 20 years later. But she was one of four. And of hers, one had seven, one had three, and the others had nine. Uh, I need to tell you a little bit about the street out here. We lived in the middle of the street, next to us were two spinster ladies, next to them was a family of eight, the Thompsons. Next to them was a house of ill repute. Ill repute meant that they didn't go to church. <laughs> <laughs> next to them was the church. The next block was my grade school, Dunbar's grade school. Uh, now, Oklahoma began at Haney State in 1907. In 1909, this high school began, along with full grade school. So when you imagine there had to be people already being educated. But those schools have started two years later. So there was Dunbar Grade School, a cause that was maintained high school based on the Booker T. Washington model. So you think about it, that's my church, that's my grade school, that's my high school. A block down from that is a grocery store. Across from that is the funeral home. Down the street from that is a bakery shop. H.D. Bakery, I don't know if you really remember that name. All right. To the left of me were the Thompsons, I mean, I'm sorry, the Calvins. The next door were the Olivers with 12 children. The next was the England with 13. Up on the hill further on was Johnson's with about 14. There were about 60 children within a two block radius. Uh, and we could play softball, two, two games of softball games of touch football across the hill uh, in any given evening. When the high school got too large, they built another high school across the street from me. So then that was the grade school, the middle school, and the high school. All right. And then you had behind that the 30 some odd leads. Uh, I just remember uh, several years ago, it was strange to me, no one else went to that church except I mean, in that whole group, none of those other families went to our church uh, except the leaves. And I figured that we must have just, you know, somehow crushed them out. So for all of the leaves sang. So a choir on a particular Sunday could have 40 people in it, and 30 of them would be leaves. <laughs> I say that to say that um, I grew up in an environment that was, you talk about it takes a village to raise a child. This was a whole city of Indians. Uh, I couldn't go anywhere if people did not know me. I know where I was. 
so forth. And so I grew up in this environment, incredible, incredible energy. I mean, I drove my mother crazy with parents. I was very um, spontaneous. Um, there was a gap between my black sister and me of four years. And that gap was just enough to give me a flexibility from them because I didn't want to be with them, my brothers and sisters. And to have sort of have my parents on my own. So that was my life growing up. And when someone asked me when I went to college, what does it mean to be black in American society? I didn't know what he was talking about. I wanted to say, well, what does it mean to breathe? I mean, you don't, you didn't get up in the morning thinking of yourself as a black child doing something. You just got up and went to work, or you got up and did something. The concept of being black never even comes into the conversation. I don't know if I ever heard my mother say Negro. Never. I mean, I don't, the word doesn't come up. You just get up, you do your work, do what you're supposed to do, and you go about. When I got to college, then somehow, all of a sudden, there's a sense in terms of more racial prejudice than I'd ever seen before. In my community, I went to segregated high school, but what the community was about was education. And if you were a family that were pushing your children toward education, you were respected in that community by both blacks and white. You were not respected if you were slovenly, if you did not do your work, if you were lazy, no one respected you. I could be walking in any grand town and they said, that's really Lee's son. All right, and so in that regard, that was a sense of support for who you were as a child. My mother played on the radio glad, uh, jazz, blues, gospel, spiritual, uh, classical music, and opera on Saturday. The Five Stone, I think the Five Stone, whatever it is, theater presented opera every Saturday, and he played all Saturday long. And regardless of where you were, you heard opera. <laughs> But if you were going to the house on any particular day, it could be jazz, it could be blues, or uh, whatever, and uh, we knew it all. And so that was the life I lived. Uh, I did not know anger. I did not know hatred. I did not know, you know, I don't even know if there was such a thing as evil. I told my mother, I mean, all of my, when my brother and sister got married, I said, you know, you really did prepare for their whole life. Yeah. <laughs> because they didn't fight, all right? So I didn't know fight. I didn't really know fights. I didn't know what it was to be angry just to somebody because they were never angry. So in my first marriage, my wife went berserk one time. I had just come, I was late at the library. That's all, I was just late at the library, getting home. I came home and she started yelling and screaming. I said, what in the world is going on? I thought I was married to a crazy woman. <laughs> and I said to my mother, you didn't prepare me for this. I thought people behaved as you did. Yeah. All right. And I'm telling you this not to necessarily brag about my family, but to say that that family and those people all in my community, I've never seen on television. I've never seen in the movies. I've never seen in a play. You know blacks from the, from the television, and you know crime, and drugs, and violence, and guns, and that's all you know. You don't know the man who is middle class, who works at the post office, who sends his kids to school, who goes to church, you know, who cleans his yard, uh, who's a good neighbor, uh, who obeys the law, uh, and is just a good citizen. Those are the people I've been with. Those are all the people I've been with. Half the people in the movies I don't know. I've never seen them before. And can I relate to them? And so it's that kind of uh, stereotyping that goes in the movies uh, and often in terms of plays that was also always so very, very bothersome. And it still is a matter of fact. And so it's, um, I hope that one day that person will be portrayed appropriately uh, in the media because it really is not. And I would imagine the same thing is true of minority groups, that somehow your real portrait of who you are uh, as a minority in a society 
that's not going to be supposed to be shown on the screen. Uh, and that's my hope that will happen. So, the sense in terms of African American studies and literature was something that we also taught at my high school. I went to a school called Manual Training High School. And it was based on the Booker T. Washington model. In my hometown, there was Dunbar Grade School, Douglas based off of Edgar Douglas, Langston, Langston Hughes, we did <coughs> the speaker, and the manual training based off of Booker T. Washington. Now, he had a model in terms of training both the mind and the hand. People think that, that the boys is the hand, is the mind, and uh, Booker T. Washington is the hand, but actually Booker T. Washington was both. So you have to have an academic focus, and you have to take uh, some type of manual training. I took industrial arts. We taught 12 trades in the school. <coughs> Auto mechanics, industrial arts, cosmetology, barbering, shoe repair, homemaking, uh, commercial cooking, you name it. And you took that long enough to get <coughs> certified in it. So when you left high school, you were a certified barber, as well as a mathematician. You were a certified auto mechanic, as well as a historian. All right. And if you didn't go to college, you could go and get a job. And you could be employed. And you had certificates from GM, from Ford, and uh, Chrysler. All right, so I really thought as though that was so important for students because everyone did not want to go to college. But if you went, you were, you were definitely uh, prepared to, to, to do well. Probably 90% of my high school class went to college. And many of them worked their way through college through their skills, mostly barbers and cut hair. So I learned how to cut hair as well because my mother was a barber. And she was also, uh, you know, she also fixed hair. Um, and she had the number one shirt in the barbershop downtown. Did my father really did not like it. He did not like that shaving men. He did not like cutting men's hair downtown in the window. So when I heard about this discussion, I said to, I said to my brother, what do you think mom's going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, I don't know. He said, but you know, dad is really upset about her cutting hair downtown. I said, I don't know. I don't know. So that was this debate among the four of us. What will mama do? Um, well, what Mama did was to build a big room on the side of the house and convert it into a barber shop. And so I said to my brother, do you think that's going to help? Now the men are going to be coming to the house. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it worked out. It worked out. Um, and it was, uh, it was very, very important. My father was Baptist. My mother was Methodist. But she decided to raise her children as Baptists. But you know, the Baptists are conservative. The Methodists are liberal. Uh, Baptists cannot go to ball games. They cannot dance. They cannot play cards. Those kind of things. The Methodists can. And so when my father left, my mother taught us how to play cards, taught us how to dance. You know, um, and I, you know, I said, to my brother, my brother said, you know, do you think she think? You think she's a heretic? I said, what's a heretic? He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> he said, but I think that I see you might be upset. But he wasn't. He was smart enough to realize that she knew better how to raise us and to provide us with a broad understanding of our society than he did. And so he let that happen. Uh, but that was, the, that was the environment I grew up in. Uh, I didn't know families without two parents unless when they died, for, you know, from that kind so there were two parents, the father worked, um, both of them took care of the children, uh, the children were obedient. And I'm not saying this is some kind of fantasy. It just was normal what happened in that neighborhood uh, and so forth. And so uh, my sense in terms of African American uh, values were embedded in my house and in the community. The high school also taught African American literature but he did it illegally. We had to have one year of Oklahoma history. So the teachers taught one semester of Oklahoma history, 
Monty Silvestro, what they call me, but, um, and they call it Oklahoma history. Uh, and when you went to school, the one book that you had to, you had to buy, you know, I, had, I think it was called uh, The History of the Negro in America. Every student had to buy that book. Uh, and that's the one that parents were, had no problem purchasing. But you had a, a series of books, and all of a sudden, that appeared the History of the Negro, America, and the Negro in America book. It was not supposed to be on the, on the uh, uh, docket at all. So that's how we learned. Um, and so when I got to high school, college, and there was nothing there about people I've been reading about, was when I realized that somehow the canon does not work, the tradition does not work. Um, my first experience with it was I was walking uh, down the, uh, in one of the major classrooms, and a book flew out the door, almost hit me. I picked it up with a book by Ben Ball called Another Country. And the woman said, I'm not reading this trash. You know, it's trash, it's nothing but trash, it's nothing but sex, it's nothing but sex. I'm not reading it, it's trash, it's trash. Why would the professor want you to read this stuff anyway? You must realize, Book Home is in the Bible Belt. <laughs> and the Bible Belt means that uh, the religion is wrapped around you uh, like a sheath, and you can't get out of it. And so, um, it was very difficult. Uh, but the master, the, the uh, professor's name was Clinton Keeler. Uh, he was a very, very good uh, American professor. Uh, and he was the one who introduced it into the curriculum. Uh, but it's been a battle. In some respects, still is a battle getting African American literature uh, within the curriculum, I think, in an appropriate way. Uh, and as much as I want to. Let me switch a little bit, but to kind of talk about myself. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both um, the definition and the short story, because as you know, one of my jobs is promoting that. Um, and then talk about how that fits into the topic today. Um, uh, I became the director of this uh, short story company in 1994. Uh, Dr. Mary Wilberger, who was my faculty uh, mentor at, at Oklahoma State, as a matter of fact, was the chair at the University of Northern Iowa where I was at that time. The conference started in Paris in 1988. Uh, 2000, it did not, I mean, uh, 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 1990, it did not uh, function, but 92, it did, and we held it at the University of Northern Iowa. And then I became the director in 1994. I then began to promote the short story and the short story writers. And this book here, speaking of the short story, uh, is the first one that I edited in terms of interviews with contemporary writers of that time. Uh, and on this list are uh, Isabel Allende, Rudolph Anaya, uh, Ray Young Bear, Clark Blaze, <laughs> Morgan Cone, yeah. Anna Rio Del Rio, Anna Douglas, Richard Ford, Shirley Lim, uh, Charles May, God, and Refugee, and so forth. Uh, and it was the first book of its kind that really had writers uh, sort of talking about the short story genre. Uh, and uh, have you ever seen this book before? I've read the review, the uh, interview, but I've never seen it. The interview was by Mary Wilbur. Yeah. Yes, yes. And as a matter of fact, I bought it to give to you. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> 